insomnia is essentially diagnosed as falling asleep during the middle of the day due to lack of sleep at nighttime. Oh, okay. But many people who are, who are having trouble sleeping at night are not falling asleep during the middle of the day. They're dealing with grogginess or crankiness or other effects of having fragmented sleep. Dr. Huberman's insight into the impact of fragmented sleep on performance is eye-opening. Many of us struggle with this issue in today's fast-paced world, and it's time to prioritize our sleep hygiene. This video is a powerful reminder of the importance of a good night's sleep and offers practical tips to optimize our rest. Let's commit to better sleep and unlock our full potential. We need to sleep enough. Now, what's enough sleep? This is an interesting question. Enough sleep? has been argued it's six hours, other people it's seven hours, other people it's eight hours. It's basically waking up without an alarm clock and feeling rested. Mm. You know, getting better at sleeping is a whole set of practices, but sleep is a slow tool. It's not a real time tool. Cause mm. if you're feeling exhausted and you have to get up and have your day, deal with children, deal with work, deal with life, we can talk about how to get better at sleeping, but in real time, what you wanna do is you want to bring more alertness into the system. Focus. Focus and alertness. The way to do that is to take advantage of a very well-established medical fact. All medical students learn this, all MDs know this, which is that there's a direct relationship between how you breathe and your heart rate. Hmm. And so when we inhale, when we inhale, it almost feels like everything's moving up. But actually what happens is our diaphragm moves down. Okay, so when we inhale, our diaphragm moves down. When that happens, our heart, literally gets a little bit bigger. The volume of the heart gets a little bit bigger, which means that whatever blood in there is moving per unit time a little bit slower. And there's a set of neurons in the heart called the sinoatrial node that sends a signal to the brain and says, hey, blood flow is slowing down. And the brain sends a signal back to the heart and says, okay, let's speed up and speeds up the heart rate. So the short, concise way to put it is when you inhale, more vigorously or longer, you're speeding up your heart rate. As you inhale, you're sending a neural signal to your heart to speed up. And when you exhale, the diaphragm moves up. The heart gets a little bit smaller, literally, because there's less space there. Then there's a signal sent to the brain and the brain sends a signal back and says, slow down the heart rate. L longer or more vigorous inhales will speed up your heart rate and make you more alert longer or more vigorous or more vigorous exhales will slow down your heart rate and make you less alert. Wow. Um, this is the basis of heart rate variability. When people talk about heart rate variability is good, you know that you don't want your heart rate to be one level all day, high or low. A lot of people don't realize that. They think, oh, I got a nice slow heart rate. <laughs> but you don't want your heart rate to be like this. You want your heart rate to go through these fluctuations. Heart rate variability is good. Why? Because heart rate variability reflects the activation of what's typically called the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the brain's ability to slow down and calm the nervous system. So mm. a, when your heart rate is going like this, it means that your heart rate is speeding up and then your brain is slowing it down. Your heart rate is speeding it up and your brain is slowing it down. And that's what's happening all day long as you're moving through things in a kind of calm alert way. Most people are aware that getting a really good night's sleep on a consistent basis is critically important, but most people don't know how to do that. In fact, I'm guessing that very few of you out there are consistently getting seven to nine hours of really terrific sleep, waking up feeling rested, like you're ready to attack the day, and being able to go through the day feeling focused and alert without dips in energy or focus. So what determines how well we sleep and the quality of our wakeful state? Turns out that's governed by two forces. The first force is a chemical force. It's called adenosine. Adenosine is a molecule in our nervous system and body that builds up the longer we are awake. So if you've just slept for eight or nine or 10 really deep restful hours, adenosine is gonna be very low in your brain and body. If however you've been awake for 10, 15 or more hours, adenosine levels are going to be much higher. Adenosine creates a sort of sleep drive or a sleep hunger. We can think of it in an analogous way to nutrition. Your nutrition and how well you feel after you eat certain foods 
your overall level of fitness and your cellular health and your heart health isn't governed by any one food item that you might eat or not eat. It's governed by a number of different factors, how often you eat, how much you eat, which items you eat, etc., and what works best for you. In the same way, your sleep and your wakefulness are the product of kind of the average of a number of different behaviors. How long you've been awake is a key one because of this molecule, adenosine. So the reason you get sleepy when you've been up for a while is because adenosine is creeping up steadily the longer you've been awake. And a good way to remember this and think about adenosine is to think about caffeine. Caffeine, for most people, except a very small percentage of people, wakes them up. It makes them feel more alert. When you ingest caffeine, whether or not it's coffee or soda or tea or in any other form, it binds to the adenosine receptor. It sort of parks there, just like a car would park in a given parking slot. And therefore, adenosine can't park in that slot. Now, when caffeine parks in the adenosine receptor slot, nothing really happens downstream of that receptor. The receptor can't engage the normal cellular functions of making that cell and you feel sleepy. So the reason caffeine wakes you up is because it blocks the sleepiness receptor. It blocks the sleepy signal. And this is why when that caffeine wears off, adenosine will bind to that receptor, sometimes with even greater what we call affinity, and you feel the crash. You feel especially tired. However, if you've ever pulled an all-nighter, you'll notice something interesting. As morning rolls around, you'll suddenly feel an increase in your energy and alertness again, even though adenosine has been building up for the entire night. Why is that? The reason that is, is because there's a second force which is governing when you sleep and when you're awake. And that force is a so-called circadian force. Circadian means about a day or about 24 hours. And inside all of us is a clock that exists in your brain and my brain and the brain of every animal that we're aware of that determines when we want to be sleepy and when we want to be awake. But the most powerful thing that's governing when you want to be asleep and when you want to be awake is light. And in particular, it's governed by sunlight. Now, I can't emphasize enough how important and how actionable this relationship is between light and when you want to sleep. So let's just break it down from the standpoint of what's going on in your brain and body as you go through one 24-hour day. Let's start with waking. So regardless of how well you slept at night or whether or not you were up all night, most people tend to wake up sometime around when the sun rises. Maybe not right at sunrise, but within an hour or two or maybe three of sunrise. But for most people, we tend to wake up about the time that the sun is rising or so. And as we do that, adenosine levels tend to be low if we've been asleep, for reasons that you now understand. And our system generates an internal signal that is in the form of a hormone. The definition of a hormone is it's a substance, a chemical, that's released from one organ in your body that goes and acts on other organs elsewhere in your body, including your nervous system. When you wake up in the morning, you wake up because a particular hormone called cortisol is released from your adrenal glands. Your adrenal glands sit right above your kidneys and there's a little pulse of cortisol Here's how it goes. You've got this clock above the roof of your mouth that churns out this 24-hour rhythm and is communicated to all the other organs and tissues of your body. But there's another structure, has a cool name. It's called the intergeniculate leaflet, which sits a few millimeters away in the brain. And it's involved in regulating the clock output through what's called non-photic, non-light type influences like exercise and feeding, etc. So if you are not feeling awake during the day and you're having trouble sleeping, get the sunlight exposure that we just talked about. But in addition to that, if you want to become an early riser, for instance, and you want to feel more awake during the early part of the day, by getting that light exposure and exercising early in the day, you will, after two or three days, you will naturally start to wake up earlier in the day. And that's because these clock mechanisms have shifted. It's like setting the clock earlier as opposed to delaying the clock. There was a really nice study that showed that viewing sunlight around the time of sunset doesn't have to be just crossing the horizon, but circa sunset, within an hour or so of sunset, 
prevents some of the bad effects of light in preventing melatonin release later that same night. Viewing light early in the day is key. Viewing light later in the day when the sun is setting or around that time can help protect these mechanisms, your brain and body, against the negative effects of light later in the day. You'd go view the sunset or you would go outside in the late afternoon or evening. Again, if you safely can do that with sunglasses off, you will. If you need to wear sunglasses, fine, but it will take probably a hundred to a thousand times longer with dark sunglasses than if you take them off. So the best thing to do is just to get outside for a few minutes, anywhere from two to 10 minutes, also in the afternoon. Having those two signals arriving to your central clock that your body, your internal world knows when it's morning and knows when it's evening is tremendously powerful. There's always a lot of questions about how long, how much, how do I know if I've had enough? You'll know because your rhythm will start to fall into some degree of normalcy. You'll start to wake up at more or less the same time each day. You'll fall asleep more easily at night. Generally, it takes about two or three days for these systems to align. So if you've not been doing these behaviors, it's gonna take a few days, but they can have tremendous benefits and sometimes rather quickly on a number of different mental and physical aspects of your health. But there are a bunch of other things that are downstream of cortisol and melatonin. Like we tend to be hungrier during our wakeful period than late at night. Some people like to eat it late at night, but if you're finding that you can't become a day person or a morning person, shifting your light exposure, exercise, and food intake to the daytime will help. Some people like to stop eating around 6 or 8 p.m. because of me metabolic reasons or they're trying to maintain their weight or lose weight. That's actually not supported so well by the literature. The literature around nutrition essentially says that it's best to restrict your feeding to a certain period of each 24-hour cycle to not be eating around the clock. If you turn on the lights before waking up, so around 45 minutes to an hour before waking up, even if your eyelids are closed, provided you're not under the, the covers, after doing that for a few days, that increases your total sleep time and shifts forward the time at which you feel sleepy. It makes you want to go to bed earlier each night. Just think about it. We don't go through the day wanting to fall asleep every 30 minutes and then feeling like we're wide awake. Our sleep and our period of sleepiness tends to be condensed into one block, typically one six to 10 hour block, although there's also variation in terms of how much people want to sleep. Even through the eyelids, before these kids woke up, then made those kids naturally want to go to bed earlier and they ended up sleeping longer. So that's something you could try. You could put your lights on a timer to go on um, early in the day before you wake up. You could open your blinds so that sunlight is coming through. And again, if you, you know, curl up under the covers, then it's not going to reach uh, these neurons. But it's remarkable the light can actually penetrate the eyelids, activate these neurons and go to the central clock. Whenever people ask me, what should I take? Which is one of the most common questions I get. What supplements should I take? What drugs should I be taking? What things should I be taking? The first question I always ask them is, how's your sleep? And 90% of the time they tell me they either have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep or they don't feel rested throughout the day. For some of you, naps are great. I love taking naps. Some people, they wake up from naps feeling really groggy. That's probably because they're not sleeping as well as they should at night or as long as they should at night. And so they're dropping into REM sleep or deeper forms of sleep in the daytime. And then they wake up and they feel kind of disoriented. So a period of time each day that you devote to getting better at falling and staying asleep is actually a really good practice to adopt. The other thing about these practices like meditation, yoga nidra, and hypnosis is people always say to me, well, when should I do them? And I always say, well, the best time of day to do it is when you first wake up in the morning, anytime you wake up in the middle of the night or any time of day. In other words, they're always good for you because it's a training mechanism by which you self-train your nervous system to go from a state of heightened alertness that you don't want to heightened relaxation that you do want. And so it's really teaching you to hit the break. We've all experienced that we can stay up if we want to, right? If we want to stay up late on New Year's or we want to push an all-nighter, some people can do that more easily than others. But we're all capable of doing that. But it's very hard to make ourselves fall asleep. And so there's a sort of asymmetry to the way our autonomic nervous system, which governs this alertness, calmness thing, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, there's an asymmetry there where we are 
more easily able to engage wakefulness and drive wakefulness, we can force ourselves to stay awake, then we are able to force ourselves to fall asleep. And one of the things that I say over and over again, and I'm going to continue to say over and over again, is it's very hard to control the mind with the mind. When you have trouble falling asleep, you need to look to some mechanism that involves the body. And all the things I described, meditation, hypnosis, yoga nidra, all involve exhale emphasized breathing, certain ways of lying down and controlling the body. But all of those involve using the body to control the mind rather than trying to, you know, wrestle your mind into a certain pattern of relaxation. And when we're having trouble controlling the mind, I encourage people to look towards the body. Look toward sunlight. Avoid sunlight if, and bright light if that happens to be late at night. So there's a theme that's starting to emerge, which is in order to control this thing that we call the nervous system, we have to look back to some of the things we discussed earlier, like sensation, perception, etc. But we have to ask, what can we control? Well, I'm talking about controlling light exposure, controlling your breathing and body. Any of those are really teaching you to use your body to control your mind and to allow you to explore the mind-body relationship in a way that gives you more control over your mind and the mind-body relationship.